Great, good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sophia. I organize Spectrum events for you, bringing the community together through learning at Spectrum. So for those of you who are new to Spectrum, we are located at Duo Tower. Aside from providing event spaces, we offer curated workspaces for the community experience. We bring together members and provide connections to expand your business. So today's webinar, in partnership with Healthcare Fintech Alliance, is on 5G as a platform for industry transformation. We are very privileged to have Jim Lim, the founder of 59ST Ventures, a socio-techno network for focusing on leveraging expertise, experiences, and connections of senior executives globally to contribute back to society. Jim is also a fellow and adjunct lecturer at NUS. So amongst Jim's long list of credentials, he is currently also the healthcare sector lead for NCS, tasked to build digital healthcare ecosystem and expand its footprint regionally. So before I hand this over to Jim, audience, if you have any questions, post them on here. They will be addressed after Jim's presentation. So without further ado, let's welcome Jim, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Thanks for the introduction. So let me pull out my slides. Okay, I hope everyone can see my slides. So uh, yeah, as uh, Sophia introduced, uh, among all, all, all my portfolios, I'm also the founder of uh, 59 ST Ventures, which is a social network. So just uh, before we start on 5G, just very quickly, why is it called 59, right? Uh, someone told me this year that actually the name, although the, the social networking group was founded in 2017, right? And people actually tell me that it, it was a forward-looking name because the 59 looks like 5G, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, but that, but that was not the intention. 59 uh, stands for many things. Uh, for, for those of us who came from a telco world, uh, there's a 99.999 telco grade uh, network or telco grade uh, solutions that we always talk about. That's why that's one of the reasons to call 59, right? And then, of course, uh, Five Nine is also an age where people probably will change their life priorities, especially in terms of career as well, right? So we want to get a lot of uh, good uh, and experienced uh, uh, professionals into this uh, social networking. So feel free to join us, right? And uh, of course, uh, Five Nine was in two thousand seventeen, the year of change, right? Uh, on the 9th of May, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, and uh, Korea changed their whether you call it a president or others, yeah. So that those are some of the reasons uh, why is it called right beyond just five. It looks like five G. Okay. So without further ado, uh, topic today is five G as a platform for industry transformation, right? Uh, I think five G is a hot topic, especially this year. About one plus months ago, Singapore announced uh, the award of the two license, one to Singtel and the other one to a joint, joint venture company uh, between M1 and Starhub. So everyone is looking at the 5G coming up. And I think most of our people will be curious of what 5G can offer yeah, to us and to the industry, right? So let me just quickly go in. Uh, a quick look at the evolution of mobile technologies. I don't know the age of the uh, participants here, right? But I'm probably old enough to start work when uh, we are at the 2G stage. And uh, I actually uh, implemented many solutions in Asia Pacific for uh, 3G systems and 4G systems, and of course now looking at 5G. Yeah. So a quick look: what is uh, the difference between 1G, 2G, all the way to 5G? Right. In the 1G world, for those who are again old enough, I probably not old enough to to use it yet, not rich enough at that time to use a 1G phone. It's like a water bottle phone. Phone. Yeah. And to many who know Chinese. It actually stands, uh, there's a name for it called Ta Ke Ta, right? Big Brother, something like that, yeah? And uh, it is uh, in a lot of those Chinese movies where the, the rich, the very rich, and maybe even the secret societies are using this phone to communicate, right? But basically, you need to be rather well off to be able to carry a mobile phone of 1G. And of course, what it's used for is used for voice calls mainly, yeah? And when we go into the 2G world where most of us would have use or know this uh, Nokia phone, which is very, very popular. Of course, today Nokia don't uh, manufacture phones anymore, right? Uh, they have sold off the business, right? But 2G world is really a text 
which mainly is SMS, text and talk world. So you have your voice call, added on capabilities is on text. Yeah, and uh, we always talk about killer application for those of us who are in the telco world, right? What are the killer applications for everyone? So when 3G come, people ask, I'm so happy with SMS and I can do my voice call. So what are the killer application, right? We always say SMS is a killer, killer application of 2G. What is the killer application for 3G? So comes 3G world without knowing too much of what can we benefit from 3G except for be uh, better speed, right? Uh, it came to the data world, right? Today is so common for every one of us. We use WhatsApp, we use data. We always say, hey, my data not enough. Maybe I need to switch to Wi-Fi so that I can conserve my data. There are some countries like Taiwan, which uh, they call it the unlimited data or eat all you can data, which uh, you have unlimited data for usage, right? So 3G world, before we started implementing 3G system, we actually never thought of what is the killer application of 3G, to be very frank. But somehow, there are applications coming out and 3G becomes, the data becomes the killer application for 3G. Yeah? And of course, with the data, it brings us to mobile internet world. Yeah? And let's look at 4G. Again, when 4G came out, uh, I was in Taiwan at that time, implementing, uh, launching 4G systems back in 2013, I think. Yeah? And uh, Singapore was, I think, half a year or one year later than Taiwan, right? Uh, to launch, uh, to commercialize 4G. But again, when 4G came out, everyone thinking, okay, it's going to be faster speed. I'm so happy with my data and mobile internet already in 3G. What is it in 4G world that I can benefit, right? No one thought about that when we start uh, planning for 4G. But of course, as 4G evolved, uh, there are new applications coming out and there are new companies, new business coming out and people kind of invented or rather popularized the use of videos. So if you can remember in the 3G world, YouTube is already there. Yeah? But people don't really use mobile to, to watch YouTube movie because it consumes a lot of data, right? And the speed and the bandwidth is not good enough and you always have lagging. So people still, uh, during the 3G world, use YouTube on your browser, on your laptop on your computer, right? But of course, with 4G, YouTube becomes so popularized that you can actually stream very smoothly on your mobile phone. A video and of course, social media become the killer application of 4G, right? Uh, I'm sure this one or two weeks, uh, you heard of this name called TikTok, right? The mother company, the parent company is called ByteDance. It's a Chinese company, something like YouTube, but it's a shorter version, right? Uh, YouTube, you can have long uh, videos, long movies, long, long, uh, things, but uh, in uh, TikTok, it's usually short, right? Within a minute kind of thing. So now US wanted to ban TikTok, right? For whatever reason it is. But again, video and social media becomes the killer application of 4G. So now comes to 5G world. If you ask me what's the killer application of 5G, I can tell you there are so many companies from the telco vendors such as Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia, all the telco companies in Singapore, you have the Singtel, M1 Starhub, and overseas, you have your big ones like AT&T, Verizon, uh, big ones in China, China Telecom, China Mobile. Everyone giving us many use cases. You can Google, you go to their website, you can see many use cases. But are they the killer application? I'm quite sure and I can tell you, nobody knows what's the killer application. Just like we didn't know when 3G and 4G will come, right? So what is 5G? Nobody knows what's the killer application. It probably one of us in this uh, uh, webinar may be one of those who will invent or come up with a killer application for 5G and you will become the TikTok or you will become the WhatsApp or WeChat or YouTube of the 5G world, yeah? So there are a lot of use cases which you can, we'll take a look at some of them later on. But again, the, I think when 5G first, the, the, the term or the concept was coined to the public in about two plus years ago, uh, people always look at phones, right? Because uh, as a consumers, we don't really know the backend technology of what the different G stands for. But to us, the most direct uh, impression of the different evolution is on the mobile phone, right? From a Nokia look phone, a text phone, to a, a, a ergonomic phone like an iPhone. And of course, in 5G, people are saying that, oh, 5G phone tomorrow will be a foldable phone, right? It may not be so, it may be so, we don't know yet, but of course, Many companies, including Samsung and Huawei, are trying to come out with folder phone, foldable phone. And why is it so? Because in 5G, everyone is trying to look at what is the evolution, right? So we are imagining that 5G, uh, I will use it more because of data, because of video, because of social media. I'll use it more like a laptop right, or a tablet. So it needs to be having big enough screen. 
So in order to still look like a phone and uh, not as bulky, and yet has the capability of a laptop or a tablet, so the foldable phone uh, uh, is born yeah, from there. So it may be really a 5G uh, phone, we don't know yet, right? It's already there, but uh, we'll, we shall see. Yeah? But of course, there's also a more advanced uh, thought of what a 5G phone or 5G will look like. Right? It's something that is uh, panel-like, very thin panel. And uh, this is not uh, uh, sci sci-fi. Yeah? Uh, there is a company in China that I have visited and know them quite well. They are not in Singapore yet. They are called Royal. Uh, the company's name is called Royo, R-O-Y-O-L-E. Right, they do a lot of uh, very thin panel that can put on your shirt and your hat as well, and of course a thin panel across uh, on your hand to look like a phone. Yeah, so that is already in progress. Yeah, and uh, they actually launched their uh, very thin panel kind of phone that can be placed on your your body or your hand in uh, CES. Yeah, the Consumer Electronics Show in US last year. Right. So again, 5G phone, is it a foldable phone or is it a thin panel-like phone that can just uh, somehow embed onto your hand or your body? Uh, yet to be seen. Yeah? But again, we are all trying to see what is the next killer application of 5G. So again, the, quickly, uh, the world is changing of chasing after 5G. So you can see that uh, whether is it in Kuwait, in Finland, right, in Philippines, everyone is doing so many different trials of 5G. And of course, later on, we'll see more uh, uh, details on the use cases. But again, generally, people are believing that 5G is like uh, enhanced or enlarged connected world, right? You have everything connected. You will be able to uh, watch and download and stream videos very fast on your mobile phone because of the bandwidth and the speed that it provides. Yeah. And of course, uh, there's a lot of talk on autonomous uh, vehicle, which again, everyone is saying that uh, 5G will allow you to do the autonomous vehicle uh, more uh, successfully, yeah? And we'll take a look on why is it so, right? So some numbers to take a look, yeah? There are all together currently about 87 operators, the telco operators, right? In 36 countries have already launched 5G trials, including Singapore, yeah? I think most of the ASEAN countries are quite running at the forefront, right? Because uh, Again, in technology, there's this thing called leapfrogging. So there are many countries who are not that mature yet. They can actually uh, leapfrog from uh, even 3G to 5G. Yeah? So they are actually uh, altogether 36 countries already launching 5G trials. Yeah? And uh, for those of you who may not be technical enough, uh, in order for 5G to be running, it's not about just your mobile phone. The most important base thing, apart from all the infrastructure, is the spectrum. right? So Singapore uh, award the two licenses uh, this uh, few months ago is because we have identified the spectrum to be given. And in 5G, there are many different spectrums involved, right? There's a common spectrum like the 3.5 gigahertz that Singapore is awarding for uh, public use. There's also the millimeter, millimeter wave that is of a higher frequency band, which uh, are more confined, yeah? And uh, for more for uh, like a stadium kind of settings that is very good to be used, yeah? And uh, it's predicted that by uh, end of this year, we will have 250 million 5G subscribers, okay? And of course, uh, there are so many different phones. And today, you probably already see from advertisements, there are phones from Huawei, from Samsung, and soon from Apple on 5G smartphones, yeah? So, looks nice. Everyone is having trials. There are so many so-called use cases. We don't know, are they going to be killer applications? Doesn't matter, right? But is the business model of 5G ready, right? What is the real use case? Is it just faster speed? So what can 5G offer us, right? Is it just faster speed, right? So let's take a look at the difference between 5G and 4G because today most of us are using 4G, right? Although some countries uh, in Europe uh, or in uh, like Middle East and Africa may still be using 3G, but most of us are probably experiencing and using 4G. So what is uh, 5G as compared to 4G, right? So these are the offering of 5G. Let's take a look how they compare with 4G, okay? So uh, I think the one that everyone kind of know is the throughput, right? Which is actually your download speed, your uplink, downlink speed, right? So in terms of uh, throughput, right? Uh, LTE stands for long-term evolution, which is uh, basically your 4G, right? So in the 4G world, uh, you can have 150 um, 
megabit per second to one gigabit per second, which is under LTEA, right? So this is the speed uh, that you can get uh, for 4G. In 5G, you can get 10 times more, right? Uh, at least 10 times more. So of course, this is as a consumer, we foresee that we can uh, download things faster, right? There's a report to always say that, okay, uh, maybe it takes uh, 10 minutes to 15 minutes to, to download something from, uh, from YouTube, but with 5G, uh, you just need the, maybe within uh, one minute you can do it, right? So it's a 10 times faster, right? But actually other than the speed and the throughput, what 5G can offer as compared to 4G is more important from other perspective. The first one is latency. This is something very, very important, right? Latency is basically something like, is there any delay in the communication, right? So in the 4G world, the latency is about 30 to 50 millisecond, right? But in 5G, uh, the standard is about one millisecond, but from the previous company where I work in, uh, one of the telco vendor uh, provider, global telco provider, it's really, uh, you can go down to even sub millisecond, yeah? And how important is this latency? We'll take a look in a while, right? Basically, is the precision. So anything that needs precision, you need to have very good and low latency. For example, uh, in the healthcare industry, right? Since I'm doing a lot of healthcare today, to do a remote surgery, right? Uh, let's say you have someone in Singapore and someone in Shanghai, right? Uh, you need to have the sub millisecond uh, latency and precision, right? That's where 5G actually add much more value as compared to 4G, yeah? The other thing is the connections. So it's 100 times more in the 5G world. And why, what is this connection thing and why is it important? So today, uh, some of you may ha have already heard of the term called IoT, Internet of Things. So Internet of Things is basically like, uh, for those consumers, right, you probably know smart home, right? Whether it's a Samsung or your Google, right? You have a smart home that can control uh, your curtains, your lights and everything, right? That is IoT to some extent from a home setting. Now, of course, Singapore is... Uh, 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 well known as a smart nation, right? Which is uh, similar to smart cities. So connections, we are talking about things like smart metering. So in the HDB flat, you will have your three meters, your gas meter, your electricity meter, and your water meter. So all these things, rather than the, everyone has to come down to take a look at the readings and then bill you and all those things, right? In a smart IoT settings, all these smart metering will be able to self-collect, right? Because of the sensors of the data, and that you'll pass back and do the analysis, right? So it really is a connected devices, connected world kind of settings. And that's where the connections uh, importance is, yeah? And of course, in future, uh, in the smart city or smart nation, we talk about things like even on your uh, 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 lampposts along the road, right? You can have cameras to do surveillance and so on and so forth. So everything will be connected, right? And uh, it's important to have 5G, because with more things being connected, you need the bandwidth to support. And 4G cannot offer the enough bandwidth for a fully connected world. Okay, <clears throat> the next two uh, is a little bit technical, so I'll just go quickly, right? And of course, uh, in terms of mobility of 5G, it can give you the mobility like a high-speed rail, right? 500 km per hour as compared to 4G. And uh, the other capabilities is called network slicing which you can imagine, uh, unlike in the 4G world, right? 5G, you are going to have, you can imagine like a cake, right? So 5G is a cake and can keep, slice the cake into different slices. And every of these slices can represent a vertical industry. For example, one slice of healthcare, one slice of uh, government services, one slice for autonomous driving. And all these slices are important to, uh, of course, offer the capabilities that is independent and no inferior interference from another industry, right? And it's not just slices by industry. It can slice by uh, offerings. For example, you can have an IoT slice as compared to, a, a, let's say, a video AR, VR kind of slices, right? So this is a little bit more technical. We can always discuss it further in future, yeah? Okay, so let's take a look uh, for those of... Uh, actually, I teach 5G in, uh, in, in university and also for corporate training, right? So uh, I think every, many people think that 5G is a very telecom-specific topic. But uh, what we're trying to say here is actually 5G is an industry topic, right? Because to, uh, you will see later on, uh, in the 5G world, it's no longer just a telecom companies like a Singtel M1 startup selling to you as a consumer. Right, you need to have an ecosystem play and the industry like healthcare, manufacturing, and so so and so forth become very important in the entire 5G ecosystems. Right. So for those of the people who are not telco background, but 
uh, will be involved a lot in 5G, I always tell them, <clears throat> there's one thing that you need to know. And uh, if you attend my class, there's one thing that I, if you forget every other thing, there's only one thing I need you to remember. That's the, what I call the 5G capability triangle, right? So this is a standard, no matter which telco or which uh, telecom uh, vendors, they will have to go by the standard, right? It's by ITU, right? And uh, that's the International Telecom Union, right? Uh, and ITU define 5G capabilities as three important things. One is what we call the EMBB, Enhanced Mobile Broadband, right? The other one is MMTC, it's called the Massive Machine Tap Communications. And the last one is URLLC, Ultra Reliable Low Latency Communication, right? So you can see in this triangle that uh, you have many different applications or use cases under different things, right? So Enhanced Mobile Broadband, what is it, right? You can ignore the fixed wireless access for now because uh, to Singapore, we are, uh, I think, more than 100% or at least 90 over percent uh, fiber connected. So we don't really need much of this uh, fixed wireless access for the last mile, right? But in the enhanced mobile broadband world, it is something where us as consumer can appreciate better because this is where you can really have the bandwidth, you can have the uh, better uh, download, upload speed, right? So this is where things like 4K, 8K videos, right, AR, VR, where you do uh, virtual gaming, online gaming, right, and cloud gaming, right? And then uh, your home broadband can be faster, right? You can have a TV running well. Right, so these are the ones that can leverage on this EMBB capabilities of a 5G, which is to some extent still pretty much uh, consumer driven. Yeah. The next one is uh, MMTC, the massive machine type. As I mentioned, uh, today world is an IoT world, right? Tomorrow's world is an IoT times many, many times more world, right? And that's where your smart home, as I mentioned before, right? Your smart metering in terms of energy and utilities. Right, Singapore probably don't have smart agriculture, but uh, I remember uh, three, two, two and a half years ago when I was uh, with Huawei, right, uh, one of the uh, customer that we have in, uh, in Malaysia uh, deals with a lot of uh, plantations, right, rubber plantation and so on and so forth. So we are saying that, okay, you put IoT devices, sensors to the rubber, rubber tree, right, and then you can start uh, checking, collecting data to see whether the foreign workers really cut at the right place and then did they steal anything or did they cut and then they, they, they need to ensure that the data collected is a pass over to do good analysis so they can always have the best you, right? So this is some kind of smart agriculture that uh, use cases that we can use a lot of IoT devices, yeah? And of course, logistic is about fleet management. So companies like DHL, FedEx use a lot of uh, 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 IoT uh, sensors and devices for what we call fleet management. And of course, tomorrow, 5G will offer more for that, yeah? Of course, Smart City, as I mentioned before, right? And URLLC is, as I said just now, is about low latency. And one of the uh, industry use case is really smart surgery, right? Uh, that's what we, uh, remote surgery, that's what we talk about. And of course, uh, things like uh, self-driving, autonomous vehicle, right? Again, you need the very precise, the precision uh, level, right? And low latency is one of the key thing to ensure that uh, the response, the communication between the console and the vehicle, right, to give command is really sub millisecond or one millisecond kind of response. If not, then uh, it may go haywire, right? The, the command and uh, response uh, between the command and the response of the vehicle and the console, there's a certain latency, there's certain delay. Then it, the sub millisecond, whether is it the traffic light turning from orange to red, all these things can create problem. Yeah. So these are the three key capabilities of what 5G can offer. Okay, so a little bit technical on this. So uh, I was at a webinar, uh, I think about three weeks ago with uh, uh, another telco from uh, US, right? And uh, they are the first one to launch uh, 5G in US. That was in 2018. So you, some audience uh, asked, uh, 5G infrastructure and those of you who knows the standards, like the different uh, 3GPP standards, which is the one defining the standards of uh, 5G, right? Uh, saying that uh, now we are still evolving even until uh, last year, the standards are still changing. How can someone launch uh, 5G in 2018 when you may not have all the infrastructure and when standards are still changing, right? So that is where the term, uh, a little bit technical, called non-standalone NSA and standalone SA come about. Right, so non standalone basically is that uh, your actual core network is still on a 4G network, right? And then uh, your actually radio, right, is using 5G, right? NR stands for new radio, 
right? I wouldn't go into the too much technical details here because I believe most of the people here are the industry player, yeah. But basically, in a non standalone world, that's where uh, many companies countries like China, uh, Korea, uh, uh, US launched 5G services uh, back in 2018 when all the infrastructure and standards are still evolving. It's because they use a non-standalone uh, uh, kind of a configuration. Yeah? And that is very useful uh, for the capabilities called EMBB to be used. So at that time, people are already able to uh, trial with ARBR, cloud gaming, and so on and so forth, right? Because that's only using one capabilities of 5G and it's mainly in a B2C kind of settings, yeah? And uh, in a real full 5G world, right? It's actually a standalone, which Singapore uh, launching uh, 3.5 gigahertz by the two companies uh, is going to be a standalone architecture, right? And the two other capabilities of 5G of URLC and MMTC can only come into full-fledged service with the standalone uh, deployment, yeah? So yeah, as mentioned here, Singapore commercial 5G will be in uh, triple five gigahertz in a standalone mode. Okay, so this is to answer some of the questions that people had before of how come uh, people can launch uh, 5G back in 2018 when things are still uh, evolving. Okay, quickly. So as I mentioned, uh, and as the topic suggested, 5G is really a platform for industry transformation. So frankly, uh, as of the study today. Uh, launching 5G can not really get all the ROI for the telco companies, right, including the vendors, if it is just focusing on faster speed and if it's just focusing on doing a consumer offering. It will not be uh, as uh, good ROI as others. Yeah. So 5G really, apart from the faster speed, as I mentioned before, is to transform industry. One of them you see, and I talk a lot about, is robotic surgery, right? And there are still a lot of doubts on that, right? Why do I want to do a robotic surgery? We'll take a look at it later. There's one use case there, yeah? And uh, the other one is uh, VRAR, right? Uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, or people may call it MR, mixed reality, right? In general, we even use the word XR, right? That can X can means A, can means V, can means M, yeah? And <clears throat> this is already uh, deployed with the EMBB as I shown just now, right? And it's very useful. It's not just for gaming, right? People always think about it as a gaming. Uh, moving forward, of course, now it's still very heavy glasses, uh, and they are, you have more uh, better glasses, smaller and more effective glasses coming out, right? And uh, we have seen even in the healthcare industry that's used for like CPR education, right? So you can use this to do the education, and of course, the actual uh, remote surgery education, not the actual operation, but the education can also be done using this ARVR kind of technology, yeah. Next one, the fish farming. I wouldn't talk about it here. It probably is not that relevant for Singapore audience. Yeah, uh, but of course, uh, it's very similar to the rubber plantation kind of uh, concept I described. Right, it's under smart agriculture to some extent, although this is fish farming. Right, but basically you have a lot of sensors, and these sensors can help to collect the data and do the analysis, so that the ultimate aim is a better you. Right, y e y i e l d. Yeah. Okay. This is again may not be that uh, familiar with the Singapore setting, right? Because we don't really have a lot of mining, right? But this is a very common use cases uh, uh, that I've seen uh, shown by uh, people like Huawei, Ericsson, and Nokia in some of the seminars that I've attended, right? So this uh, unmanned robotic mining really is uh, like a drone to some extent, right? But much bigger and involve robotics as well. So with the 5G offerings of the good speed in, in the, uh, and the throughput for EMBB, the low latency to facilitate the communications between the central console and the actual vehicle, right? And then, of course, the uh, 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 connected world, the MMTC, right? Because you have sensors on this uh, robotics uh, uh, machineries or equipments as well. So this is actually something that make full use of 5G capabilities to do the uh, robotic mining. And of course, if I extend this to a uh, Singapore context, you'll see later on there's already a trial at uh, Marine Time Port Authority, MPA of Singapore. That is something like an unmanned operation as well, although it's not about mining, yeah? Okay, smart tourism. Uh, now no nobody can travel, right? 
but uh, there are already companies and I've seen the demo from some Chinese software company where using AR VR technologies, you can try to be like at the uh, actual place itself, right? Even I've seen someone doing like a safari of Africa, right? You can wear the uh, VR glasses and then with all the settings taken uh, for the actual safari, you can really feel like you are in the car and the lions are running beside you. So that's part of a smart tourism offering. And again, that is uh, leveraging a lot on the 5G capabilities. Of course, 4G today, you can do it as well. But due to the latency right, and the throughput, so sometimes you may feel giddy if there's a lot of movement, right? Uh, especially like in a tourism case, there's movement and you may feel giddy, right? And 5G will reduce that giddiness uh, that you are using the uh, VR applications. Okay. Last uh, but not least, I know not the last one yet, live action sports. So as I say, uh, you can have uh, using again like the uh, VR technology, you can feel yourself like an audience in a live sports uh, uh, setting, right? And of course, with millimeter wave kind of uh, offerings of 5G, that's another case where you can ensure everyone in the stadium can have that uh, speed to do uh, the necessary uh, mobile communication. Yeah. Okay, let me just quickly move on. The smart, sorry, smart manufacturing, I will have one slide to talk about that, right? But that's another one that's very commonly quoted as a use case for 5G, yeah? And the last one is about smart uh, agriculture, which I already talked talk about just now, yeah? Okay, so these are some of the common use cases that many companies actually quoted. But again, as I mentioned, are any of this going to be a killer application? Uh, unknown yet? For us to find out and after all these trials and commercialization the one with the first mover advantage and innovative solutions will really be able to generate the killer application yeah okay so very quickly i will focus on two industry uh, use cases here uh, mainly because of their sizes right uh, so one of them is manufacturing the other one is healthcare Right. So from this uh, study by STL Partners in UK, you can see that uh, uh, manufacturing, right, uh, 5G will contribute 1.4 trillion US dollar to the global GDP, and manufacturing, right, by year 2030 will be uh, the largest, right. Even from now to 2030, manufacturing is contribute the largest. Uh, 5G contribute largest to the growth and the GDP of manufacturing. And what is the impacting manufacturing, right? So you can see from this. Uh, uh, left bottom corner, right? It's going to create 740 billion in additional GDP by 2030 just in manufacturing, right? And it's split by countries, North America, East Asia, and so on and so forth, right? So this is uh, what it's going to add. And we'll see in the next slide the smart, smart manufacturing kind of use cases, right? And for the 5G impact in healthcare, uh, there are three key things being listed here, but being in healthcare today, I'm seeing much more than that, right? So things like remote patient monitoring, which again, uh, I'll explain later. Uh, today, well, in Singapore or maybe in the global, we do not use a lot of remote monitoring yet, right? We do teleconsult. That means we either use an app through a, a video call to the uh, doctors and do a teleconsult, right? But we don't do a tele-diagnostic yet, yeah? But in future, with 5G, <coughs> we're expecting to have more of this uh, remote monitoring, which I can also term it as a tele-diagnostic, yeah? And of course, virtual consultation is like your tele-consultation that I talk about and there are others. So 5G impact to healthcare, although it's not the second largest, right? Manufacturing is the largest, followed by retail, followed by transportation, which is like fleet management and logistic, right? And then the fourth one is health. But because I'm in healthcare today and I'm studying quite a lot on 5G impact in healthcare, Right, uh, that's why we want to share manufacturing and healthcare today. Okay. Okay, let's go to smart manufacturing. So again, uh, what we try to map up here is on the left hand side, you can see this table, right? There are four key things uh, that's happening in the smart factory, smart manuf manufacturing case, right? It's using the capabilities of 5G like URLC, right? MMTC and uh, EMBB, right? So if I go through this process, right, things like you be ubiquitous wireless connection. So today, right, uh, again, depending on the size of the factory, uh, when I was working in China, uh, many of the factories uh, before 5G was launched, they are using a lot of uh, lease line, wireline line connections, right? Some of them may be using uh, wireless, right? But very few if there is any using 4G, right? Most of them are using Wi-Fi uh, for that. But to some extent, uh, for those of us who know Wi-Fi itself is uh, much less secure 
as compared to uh, uh, the 5G and the 4G, right? That's why uh, uh, there is always a, a, a talk by the police, right? If you are in, in a public area using public Wi-Fi, try not to do any uh, online transactions because uh, you may be hacked, right? It's less secure as compared to using your data, which is today on 4G. So by similar token, uh, Wi-Fi in a factory setting, right, is less secure, although it can be dedicated, yeah? So tomorrow's world, 5G can offer this good wireless connection, right, which today 4G cannot. Yeah, because of the multiple connected devices. Yeah, of course, there are other uh, possible technology like today, uh, there's a the launch of this thing called Wi-Fi 6, right, which can also potentially serve that need. But again, like what uh, we have discussed in one of the webinar, whether you use a Wi-Fi 6 or you use a 5G, it depends on the size of your factory, the needs, what you want to use for, the use cases, and of course, your budget. Yeah, okay. The other thing is sensor data acquisition. So in a smart factory, right, there are going to be a lot of sensors. What are the sensors used for? Right? It's used for predictive machine uh, analytics, which can mean that okay, you have all the sensors on your machines right? so that it can do a predictive maintenance. So you know you can roughly collect data and then you can see there's machine learning being deployed, the AI being deployed to see when likely that this machine is going to break down and what you need to do to do predictive maintenance, right? So these will need sensors and sensors will acquire the data, right? So this is some kind of connections, right? Under sensors, uh, data acquisition. And of course, uh, you also do real-time remote production monitoring, right? Again, you need sensors for that to happen, yeah? And then this is uh, by itself already said, sensor-based machinery, right? So remote management, right? Uh, there are some videos that you can see uh, on YouTube that people take a pet, Right, a tablet, and you can start monitoring not in the factory itself, right? So these again are through some connected sensors, right? A sensor based scanner. So you can see everything is sensor, right? Sensor based smart truck also linked to your fleet management, right? So everything is sensor, and there are so many sensors. As I mentioned, there's this capability called MMTC, machine mesh, massive machine type communication. So with so many sensors, your 4G doesn't have enough bandwidth to sustain all of them, and that's why 5G offers the bandwidth that's needed for that, yeah? So uh, I already talked about uh, equipment predictive maintenance, right? So all these are linked to the MMTC capabilities, yeah? Okay, so this is uh, what is happening in the factory floor that we have seen in some of the smart factory in China, yeah? And of course, uh, uh, we may not have so many factories in Singapore, we have some, but may not be the largest. Although I was told uh, by EDB, I think three years ago, actually uh, manufacturing sector and its related services contribute the highest to uh, Singapore GDP as well. Yeah? But again, moving beyond a uh, factory floor setting, right? Outside of uh, enclosed factory floor, they are also uh, manufacturing related. For example, on the right hand side, there's this oil rigs, right? So this is very similar to the uh, unmanned uh, mining robots, right? Again, you use unmanned operations for oil rigs because these are to some extent uh, uh, dangerous places uh, for human to keep on working there, right? So as far as possible, there is uh, intention to automate uh, some of this into an uh, unmanned operation. So thinking out loud, it may be applicable to uh, Singapore Jurong Islands uh, operation one day. Yeah, Surveillance and inspection using 5G drones, right? Again, just now we already seen drones is to some extent unmanned vehicles, right? Although it's much smaller than uh, equipment or uh, robotics, but again, it's unmanned. And with a 5G capability, all this unmanned autonomous kind of thing will benefit from the 5G uh, capabilities, right? And again, I was also three years ago discussing with... Uh, a company that provide uh, services to a uh, uh, petroleum company uh, without naming it, right? So uh, you have drones that can do this uh, monitoring, right? And inspection of the operations. They also come up with what they call the anti-drone uh, technology, which is very interesting because you are also worried that your competitor or, or maybe in some countries, even your, your uh, competing countries, right, or your, your enemy's country, may send drones to bomb your oil rigs or petroleum plant, right? And that's where this anti-drone technology, you can do a Google of that. It's very interesting when I read about that, right? Anti-drone technology that can do uh, anti-drone uh, uh, monitoring and any sabotage, okay? Yeah, so this is a smart manufacturing use case. Let's quickly move on to a healthcare use case, right? 
uh, I'll just with the time, I'll just quickly move on to uh, all the three. So again, I kind of classify them into the EMBB capabilities on the uh, leftmost, middle is the MMTC, and the rightmost is the uh, uh, URLC. So in the uh, EMBB world, right? So for example, increasing uh, data heavy applications, like we, are, we want to use ARVR for remote uh, education, whether is it CPR, is it remote surgery, right? Uh, using ARVR, the current solution is to do traffic optimization. So without 5G, right? Current solutions means without 5G, what do you do, right? So in a hospital setting, there's a lot of traffic, traffic offloading into other networks. It can be dedicated lease line, it can be Wi-Fi, depending on security level, right? But 5G, you don't need to do all these different types of connections or connectivity. 5G alone should be able to uh, handle the traffic, yeah? Because of the EMBB capabilities for that, right? So the healthcare applications will be things like ARVR for remote education, diagnosis, and surgery. But this case, we're talking about demo because the actual surgery operation we classify under the third box here, yeah? So the second box is, again, the MMTC, which I say is the IoT, right? So in the healthcare settings, there is this term, which you can Google also, it's called IOMT, Internet of Medical Thing, right? So just like IoT, just that here we focus on uh, medical devices. And medical devices, you can look at it from two perspectives. One is within the hospital settings, you have many different equipments, right? That you need to kind of connect them, right? And the other one is with the consumerization of healthcare, uh, these IOMT also move outside of the hospital setting. For example, right, you can imagine a case where I'm wearing uh, remote diagnostic uh, uh, wearables or maybe ECG, right? So uh, I'm not connected to the hospital where I'm at home, right? But in the future 5G world, there is a, a use case where people are saying that, okay, instead of everything done in the hospital or before going into the hospital, I can have all the medical devices, uh, consumer medical devices on myself, right? Doing the long-term monitoring, whether especially for chronic diseases, right? Then all my data will be periodically sent back to the hospital settings, yeah? And if anything goes wrong, right, there will be a virtual ambulance or connected ambulance that's being triggered when a person with chronic disease uh, suddenly uh, collapsed at home, right? And the ambulance will come and pick the person up or connect or, or informing the uh, relative or family members. And then before going to the hospitals, all the data of the long-term monitoring is already uh, uh, passed to the hospital itself. Right. So in the IOMT world, it's not just connected devices within the hospital setting, but it's also looking at moving some of this outside of the hospital setting into the home care or community-based healthcare. Yeah? But of course, there will be security concerns and we can talk more about that right? separately. Okay. So current solutions of all these connected devices are running a lot on 4G network, which has a bandwidth limitation. Right? And there's also some of them... Uh, for those of you familiar with IoT, there are different standards and network, right? There is this thing called LoRa, which is quite uh, uh, widely used in Europe, right? You have SigWave, uh, ZigWave, and SigFox, and ZigBee. So there are def different IoT networks uh, standards. Uh, Singapore is going to standardize for the broad one. It's going to be MPLT together with 5G, yeah? So yes, there are solutions, but again, disintegrated, which may cause data synchronization problem, right? And uh, some of these may have security issue because a lot of these are under what we call the unlicensed spectrum operations, yeah? Okay, so 5G will enable all this, as I mentioned, I will not repeat it, right? And it's very useful. And this is highly thought as a very important and likely use case in the healthcare setting, right? You can see all this like a panel-like kind of thing that's embedded or uh, uh, attached to your body, right? For all this health monitoring, yeah. And all these are not Nirvana. Some of these are already being manufactured and under trials. Okay, the last one is about remote surgery, right? Uh, without going into too much detail, I already described a lot of that, right? Doing remote surgery because of the low latency that gives you the precision. And of course, uh, in future, we are looking at human-robots collaboration, which there's a term called cobots. Right, so you will, uh, you have the real doctors working with robotic arms because of precision, right, and uh, going to do the operations together. So again, these are uh, use cases that are already happening. 
Okay, so uh, you have seen the manufacturing case, you have now seen the healthcare. So very quickly, again, one more slide on healthcare. I think that was in February or March this year, right? China uh, has already successfully tested the world first remote surgery using 5G mobile network. So you can do a more search about that, yeah? So, and uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the y-axis is your latency, right? Uh, you can still do remote diagnostic, what rounds, uh, drones, right? If your latency is not that low, but to really do an AR-aided surgery or surgical robots, you need super low latency, right? And this one is on the throughput. The x-axis is a throughput, yeah? Okay, quickly, uh, 5G value systems, right? So, as I mentioned, uh, maybe even up to the 4G world, uh, as consumer or as a vertical industry, right? Whether you're in healthcare, you're in retail or whatever, you still work with the telco companies of your know, Singtel M1 startup, like uh, buying things off them, right? Whether we're consumer or we're enterprise. That's why you can see in uh, today's world, uh, you are familiar with the telco uh, organization. They are still very classified like uh, consumer, right? Enterprise, you have a CEO for enterprise, CEO for consumer, CEO for international, and so on and so forth, right? This is how a telco is set. And of course, with 3G and especially 4G, uh, they realized, the telco companies realized that there's this big thing called over-the-top OTT providers, right, which actually offer applications on top of the network, right, and you may not be able to charge them at that time. So people like WhatsApp, right, these actually disrupted the entire telco ecosystems and uh, how many of us really uh, pay to use IDD call uh, today, right? Uh, if For those old enough to remember, we always dial 001, followed by the country code, followed by the phone number. So that's IDD call. And you, we all remember that we pay a lot for that, right? With WhatsApp, WeChat, Skype, and all this coming up, who really pay for the IDD call today, right? You just call your relative overseas uh, using WhatsApp, right? And you can do video call as well, right? So telco companies or telco ecosystem is being disrupted uh, every now and then as well, right? And in the 4G world, it's still pretty much looking like this, right? It's still a very telco product protect uh, providing connectivity uh, in a pipe to the consumer or the enterprises but in the 5g ecosystem uh, everyone is foreseeing a change in that right of course you still have all this that telco need to serve but the use cases is going to come also from the industry player of the healthcare of the manufacturing and so on and so forth right it's no longer that Okay, as a telco, I mean, it can be, right? A telco may choose, I still just sell you connectivity, right? You buy a bulk of data from me and then you can use it. But they are going to remain what we always call as a dump pipe. And the more forward-looking telco do not want to remain as a dump pipe because how much can you sell connectivity for? The ones who are making money today are the WhatsApp and the TikTok and the others, right? So how do you collaborate with the industry player? In future, let's say, take, take the case of... Uh, smart manufacturing again. So the telco can sell the connectivity to the factory, right? And that's it. But the factory will work with an IoT uh, system provider, content provider, right? Healthcare will work with uh, people who built uh, content for AR, VR education. So how can telco do all this thing and get involved in the ecosystem? The more forward-looking one will want to do bundling, right? Together with some of this content provider. And maybe you work with a healthcare provider, let's say you work with, just for example, uh, a Singtel work with Tantok Seng Hospital, right? Come out with a remote uh, uh, a CPR education, right? And you have, of course, you have content providers there. And then you can package it and sell it, right? Another case can be a, uh, uh, what is uh, STL partner from UK keep on pitching, right? Uh, telco in health. So in tomorrow's world, probably you have a lot of uh, remote home, home-based uh, diagnostic and monitoring. That's where you can actually offer, right, a, a remote home-based kind of uh, 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 healthcare uh, solutions to the consumer as well, right? So that's the value systems. Okay, I think... They are telling me I'm running out of time a little bit. So uh, quickly go into 5G ecosystems, right? So I was asked uh, to present in uh, investor forums, right? Where uh, they are not techies. They are not interested on building the 5G application. They want to know what company to invest in, buy their stocks. Yeah. So I'm not telling you a stock pick here. I don't intend to, right? But what I want to say is that you don't just buy a telco uh, stocks, right? Because 
again, as you have seen by now, 5G is an ecosystem. It's not just the telco will benefit from it. In fact, if telco are not forward-looking enough, they may not benefit from it. So you don't need to go and buy a Huawei, which you can't buy because it's not listed. Right? You don't need to just go and buy a Cisco or Samsung or Ericsson stock. These are the ecosystem players who may be making a big difference if any of this become a killer application like the 3G in 4G world. Right? And all this, again, if you remember, and you must remember your 5G capabilities triangle, right? the EMBB, the MMTC, the URLC. Right? So for all this, you have a lot of companies coming out with different applications, right? EMBB, I think all of us will be most familiar because that's linked to the consumer world, right? Uh, 4K video, internet gaming, cloud computing, probably something that's not so familiar to you is telepresence, right? So EMBB is something that you can look at. And then MMTC is a lot with the IoT companies, right? So your smart home buildings, you probably never heard of some, some of these companies, right? Uh, for those of you who probably know, uh, it's limited to Google, Samsung, and Xiaomi. But the Xiaomi or does uh, Google manufacture all the IoT devices? They don't. Actually, they work with many companies like Xiaomi is an ecosystem. So for those of you familiar, right, since I know them quite well, they don't build all the devices, you know, they actually outsource. They build the platform. They are the ecosystem owner, but all the smaller companies in China, and that's how they make it big, they start building the devices that can connect to a Xiaomi platform. The same goes to Google, the same goes to others. So the big companies, of course, you can buy their stock, but they are more the ecosystem owner and the platform owner. right? You have other companies, smaller ones, which will have a higher potential growth. Right? So same thing for URLC, you have another bunch of companies here that are focusing on URLC, right? So remember, 5G is really an ecosystem and I'm looking forward to maybe companies who can set up new companies to benefit from the 5G, yeah? So quickly, uh, I understand, uh, although this is an uh, audience coming from different countries, but maybe main bulk of them come from Singapore, so people will be interested on how is 5G status in Singapore, right? A few things, uh, the bottom right first, Right, 5G coverage for the commercial uh, launches, like people like us, the consumer will benefit from it. Uh, IMDA has uh, asked the two companies, uh, Singtel and the JV Co. JV Co is the joint venture company between M1 and Starhub. Right, these two companies need to roll out 5G standalone network. Right, uh, by end of 2020, need to cover 50% of Singapore. Yeah, by end of 2025, need to cover at least 95% of Singapore. Right. Not there will be potentially penalties. So this is the Singapore 5G status, right? And MDA, this one you can go to MDA website to get, right? They are focusing on a few industries. So for Singapore companies who may want to benefit uh, from 5G uh, rollout in Singapore, right? You can focus in things like smart estates, right? So these are the things that uh, uh, there is a, a, a trial between Capital Land, Navi Info, Data Tech, and TPG on smart estate. estate. Right, that's the C V2X. V2X stands for vehicle to everything, right? Or anything, right? It can be vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to human, or whatever, right? So basically that is under smart estate. Of course, in the show 4.0, everyone talk about this term, right? But what does it really mean? So MDA focusing for this for 5G is really to look at AI, IoT, and robotics, which uh, there are many uh, companies and trials that's happening, yeah. Mobility, uh, autonomous vehicle, right? You have NTU and M1 that already tested it. I think it's in the news. Many of you read about that. Recently, I have brought in a Chinese company called Neolix, right? Uh, Chinese is called uh, Xing, uh, Xing Shi Qi Shi Dai Wu Ren Che. It's something like a new uh, Stone Age autonomous driving, right? So uh, they are trying uh, to do some autonomous driving because they are very successful. They are an Alibaba invested company. And uh, in, during this uh, COVID-19 situation, they, their autonomous vehicle actually was deployed in China uh, doing disinfection, number one, and also distributing the medical uh, PPE, the personal protection equipments like the mask, the glove, the so on and so forth, to the public, right? So it was a very useful use case uh, for, for COVID-19, yeah? Marine time, as I mentioned, uh, you have seen just now also your unmanned uh, vehicle, right, or AGV or drones that is doing the inspection and doing unmanned operation that's already happening between Singtel M1 and PSA, yeah. So, of course, consumer applications, there are plenty of it. Uh, everyone is coming out with uh, uh, 
new AR VR glasses, uh, new online gaming, right? But of course, the biggest news is about Razer and Singapore and Singtel launching the cloud gaming. Yeah. So these are some of the uh, focus areas of Singapore uh, 5G trials, and of course, uh, welcome new companies to join in as well, right? Okay, future skills of 5G. So I presented 5G in a Skill Future Festival, I think last week, right? Uh, organized by the government, right? Uh, SSG and WSG. So uh, I was asked the question. So if today I'm not a telco background person, I'm not an engineering background person, so can I uh, find a job in this 5G uh, ecosystem? The answer is yes, because apart from all the networking, right? There is a lot of, uh, like I say, content uh, development. So I work very closely with uh, AR VR companies, right, to develop contents. Most of these people don't have telco background. They are not even engineers, right? You have, uh, like, in the advertising advertising world, you have creative director who really know how to create the content, right? If you are creating content for uh, uh, healthcare, like CPR, you need the healthcare experience to do that, right? If you are creating content for uh, in UK, uh, two years ago, I saw this content company creating content to teach the firemen how to uh, uh, actually uh, distinguish the extinguish the fire, right? And uh, because you cannot send the firemen into a real fire scene, uh, a new fireman into a real fire scene to train them, right? So you need all this simulation. And ARVR is a very good simulation for that. So you need content uh, creators also for people who knows the fireman industry, right? So these are all potential skills that are beyond just the normal engineering telco kind of thing. Yeah, of course, those are still there, right? So the to address industry ecosystem, the right boxes are the skills that you need to have also or good to have, right? It's not just the, the telco skills. Okay, as I mentioned, 5G is an ecosystem of future skills. So 5G alone, right, you look at it by now, is providing the connectivity. But connectivity alone is not good enough because you need to use it. It must be use cases and applications. And to realize that, you need AR, VR, which is another set of technology. You have robotics, you have AI, you have data analytics, you have blockchain. So all this coming together and 5G provide the good conduit for all this to even function better than what they are today. Yeah? So 5G, system, 5G is really an ecosystem of future skills, the way I look at it. Yeah? Okay, I think this is my last slide. So for those who are interested to learn more about 5G, and uh, I have a course with NUS, right, that you can sign up for. Uh, it's a combination of e-learning and also a face-to-face -face workshop, right? The e-learning focusing more on building your basic uh, foundation knowledge of 5G and the face-to-face -face workshop we will discuss. I will show you use cases. And we will discuss using BMC, the Business Model Canvas uh, framework, to come up with new potential use cases and hopefully killer applications for the 5G industry. Yeah, And uh, of course, now with uh, so many e-learning, right? So we got feedback to say, can we do a discussion? Because we would like to discuss with the instructor. So we are also getting uh, approval for SSG funding for the instructor-led uh, workshop, even for the e-learning part. Yeah. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for the great sharing. So, um, would you like to stop share your screen? I will uh, put up some other questions I think the Q&A pop here. up a few times, but uh, I didn't manage to take a look. <laughs> it's all right. So, it's a great time for us now to address uh, some of the questions. Um, okay. So, the use cases, I think most of this has been shared as well. Okay. So, maybe um, this question. Um, what changes will we see in 6G transitioning from 5G from an anonymous attendee? What changes will we see when the transition of 5G will happen? I don't know what is in 6G yet, <laughs> to be very frank. I mean, yes, there's a lot of talk, right? Even, uh, I think just yesterday, someone in Singapore told me that he's researching into 6G already. So frankly, uh, I'm not a 6G expert, right? So what I know is today we are just going to commercialize 5G. And as I mentioned, right, 5G is not just a technology, right? There's a lot of things associated with it that needs to be ready, right? What we see is infrastructure. You need to have the network, you need to have the base station, right? And what we see is the consumer devices like a portable or foldable phone or the, uh, the panel like kind of phone, right? But it's not just that. The most important thing, as I mentioned, is like spectrum, 
right? So spectrum is limited. It's a limited resource. You cannot just suddenly say, okay, this spectrum I want to use for 5G or 6G, right? So uh, the standards need to define what, what frequency is 6G going to be used, right? So like 5G, there has three ranges of frequency. Right. The most common one that Singapore is using is 3.5 gigahertz. There's a millimeter wave, which is more than 20 gigahertz. There's a very low one, which is uh, less than 700. Yeah? So all this spectrum, today, they are not idle. Right? They are not just idling there doing nothing. For example, some of it in Singapore, uh, uh, some of the spectrum that we want to use for 5G are used by satellite. So I cannot just suddenly say I want to launch 5G and I, I bring down the satellite. So I need to clean up the spectrum so that I can use 5G. Same thing, uh, before 6G can happen, which I predict, maybe if you look at my evolution, right, every 10 years is 1G to 2G, 2G to 3G, to 4G to 5G. So it probably is a 10-year cycle to move from one generation to another generation. Maybe we'll move faster, I don't know, right? but uh, I will foresee at least eight to 10 years. So there are many things to be done before we can even talk about 6G. Yeah. So you need to clear up the spectrum and there's this technical industry term called spectrum re-farming. So uh, for those of you who know, uh, for example, Singapore today, we still have 3G, 4G coexisting, right? But no more 2G, right? In Taiwan, there's no more 3G because they retire the entire 3G spectrum and they re-farm it Right, you reconfigure it like a reconfiguration for 4G use. Right? So same thing, when 5G comes up, Singapore potentially will need to retire 3G as well and you can refund some of this for use. Yeah. Great, thank you. So there's another question from uh, Go Teng Chiu. How are 5G sensors powered? Will power requirements for sensors a concern? Yeah, so again, uh, actually it's not just 5G. So a lot of these IoT devices, right, especially for the smart sensors, we are looking at low power uh, connections, right? Because you need to put, for example, I was talking about this smart waste management where you put into the, the, the bus bin or whatever, right? You need that device, the sensors to last for at least 10 years before you want to <laughs> replace it again, right? So uh, there are already a lot of low power sensors that's available, right? And, uh, and there are also low power networks LPWA that all these things can sustain. But of course, that is one of the reasons why 5G wants to go with MB IoT, right? The narrow band uh, uh, IoT network as well, because they complement each other rather well as compared 5G with maybe an unlicensed spectrum of a LoRa and others, which may not have the best uh, combination in, in terms of speed, throughput, and also uh, power consumption. Bill, um, do you have time? Uh, just uh, one last question. So what's your prediction in terms of pricing for 5G plans for consumers? Is it going to be more expensive or cheaper? What's your this is a tough question. Uh, <laughs> my prediction cannot uh, change the way the telco want to price. <laughs> so, I mean, again, there's this thing called Gartner hype cycle, right, which we see a curve like that. Right, it always say that if you are an early adopter of technology, you probably pay a little bit more. Lah right premium right but again uh, you can google also google for bcg boston consulting group uh, opex right opex o p e x right so there was a paper published by bcg uh, together with uh, uh, some inputs from us uh, 2 years ago uh, in terms of the opex of 5g comparing to 4g actually it is lower if you exceed a certain number of uh, data usage right so, for example, if you more than 10 terabyte, I can't remember the exact numbers, if you exceed 10 terabyte of data, right? 5G OPEX is lower than 4G. So, logically, by that same token, telco shouldn't charge more because they benefit, uh, they, their cost is lower running a 5G, right, in the long term as compared to running 4G. But of course, now CapEx investment is there, right, for any new technology. But from OPEX, which is more important from a long-term perspective, OPEX for 5G is supposed to be lower than 4G due to the massive connections that you have. So I expect them to charge cheaper <laughs> to make it simple, but of course, it's not me to <laughs> influence that decision. Yeah. Great. So um, a lot of you um, have asked um, whether there's recording. Yes, we will be sending a recording link to uh, each of you. Um, presentation, uh, let me um, discuss this with Jim. See. Uh, how uh, much information we can share with you. Um, any um, further questions, um, you can reach out to Jim on LinkedIn 
or you can go through Spectrum as well. So I would like to thank uh, Jim for today's uh, great sharing and insights. Thank you, audience, for joining us. Hope you had brought uh, back um, new information for work as well as for personal capacity. And thank you to uh, Healthcare Fintech Alliance as well in partnership uh, for this webinar. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, audience, uh, please fill up the survey once you, um, once you exit from this webinar. I look forward to see you at the next session, which is on the 27th of August on eSports. Once again, thank you, audience. Thank you, Jim, for the great session today. So, thank you, Sophia, um, and thanks to the audience for listening. Hope that it was uh, useful and fruitful for you. Yeah. Definitely. So stay safe, keep well, everybody. See you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.